life and to, to physical integrity, but that brings in also the pregnant woman and her rights? Or is it because, for, for simple pragmatic reasons, it seems not to be a good idea to have this abortion? The relation with the husband, the, the father-to-be, would be destroyed and all sorts of uh, bad consequences would crop up. We can realize this. Well, we have to run through all sorts of, of hypotheses of this kind. There's no way to prove, I think, uh, in one simple argument that one moral principle is superior to all others. But, but you have to use this um, indirect, piecemeal approach, and, and then you can see that, well, in this situation, a certain principle seems fruitful. You, you think that this principle explains this moral intuition you have here. And then you have a kind of symmetry. Well, if, if this is the best explanation of the conclusion you have made, you have made an inference then to the best explanation, you say. You have the, the principle explaining this instance. And you can go also the other way around and say that this instance confirms this principle. You have relations of explanation on the one hand, and you have relations of, of confirmation on the other hand. And this is, I mean, we know this from, from the basic courses in, in scientific methodology, and I think it's no different in morality. But this, of course, is only the, the beginning of a long process, because uh, we must try out this principle that we have found is the best one in this situation, in new situations, and we must try to see whether it also gives the right explanation in those situations. And perhaps you have to revise our principle, we have to revise our intuitions about particular uh, situations. And hopefully, when we have pursued this uh, method for some time, we end up in something that uh, the Harvard philosopher John Rawls has called a reflective equilibrium. Uh, all our views cohere with each other. They explain each other, and they are consistent with each other, and so forth. And then I would say that we are justified in our moral beliefs when we have arrived at them in this manner, and then we can use them, explain them, uh, to, to draw conclusions about what to do also in new particular cases. But, but uh, we must al always remember, of course, that having a justified belief is different from, from having a true belief. Justification is one thing, truth another thing. And we know from the history of science that, that scientists have often been, been justified in all sorts of beliefs that has, have turned out to be false. But if we, have, we happen to have a true belief, and be, we happen to be, if we are justified in it, then we could say that we have moral uh, knowledge as well. Now, assume that this picture is roughly correct, then. Uh, where does God enter the picture? Is there any room for God in this uh, picture of morality? For example, if God is dead, does that mean that everything is permitted, as Dostoevsky had it? No, I mean, Dostoevsky was just wrong about this. Uh, no moral conclusions. And, and the statement that everything is permitted is a moral conclusion follows from any assumption of this kind. I think he was wrong. As a matter of fact, I think there is very little space left for God in this picture of morality. So if you accept it, it might be difficult to find a place for God in it. Uh, now, for the rest of the discussion, I will assume that God exists. I mean, we're not discussing whether God exists or not. Just assume that God is, exists. And assume, I will also assume that he, he possesses, he or she or it, or whatever you like, possesses those, those attributes that we usually attribute to him. That is, he is uh, omniscient, he is almighty, and he is infinitely good. Something of the kind is true of him, and, and, and he does exist. And yet, for all that, I think there is no room for him in this picture of morality. He is irrelevant from a moral point of view. Now, there seem to be three ideas. How much time do I have? Seven minutes, OK. Uh, seven minutes for three ideas. One of them is the ontological idea that God enters the pictures by deciding what is right or wrong. If God says that something is right, then it is right, because he has said so. And if he says that something is wrong, 
and it is wrong because God has ordained that it is wrong. The other, we could say, is an epistemological view to the effect that even if God can't decide what is right or wrong, and I will argue that he can't, even if he exists and, and have these attributes, uh, he might at least uh, tell us what to do and give moral advice. I will reject that idea as well. Then at last we have the motivational approach, that even if God can't decide what is God, good or bad or right or wrong, even if he can't advise us about moral things, he can at least motivate us, give us a motive to, to perform right actions rather than wrong actions. I will deny that as well. I will have none of this. Uh, let me just briefly then indicate what I think is wrong about these ideas. First, the idea that God could decide what is called right or wrong. I, I, will, I think this is really, for moral reasons, outrageous to, to believe that he can. I mean, there are all sorts of candidates to plausible moral principles, giving uh, ideas about what are right-making and wrong-making characteristics of actions. And I think plausible such candidates are things such as uh, you should not hurt people because it doesn't feel well to be hurt, or you shouldn't violate their rights because it's uh, a dishonor to, to a person if, when you do, and so forth. You, you must have a morality that is focused on the patient, so to speak, not on the agent and not on the spectator that's standing behind, uh, be, beside and, and giving uh, advice about the situation. So I think it's, it's something utterly wrong in the idea that God, uh, God's will would be in this way a good-making or right-making or wrong-making characteristic of actions. Also, I mean, we have the well-known objection then that if God had wanted, had liked torture, for example, then torture would have been right, uh, which is also a strange implication, I think, of this idea. Perhaps there are ways of avoiding this conclusion, and we might come back to them in the discussion, but they run into other difficulties, I think. So this is a non-starter, I think. It's even kind of blasphemy, I think, to, to think that, that God uh, decides what is good and bad because it makes God not infinitely good, but, but self-conceited, rather. I mean, what does it mean, then, that God is infinitely God, it, good? It means that he loves himself so much that no one can love himself anymore. I, I think that is kind of heresy, really, to, to adopt this point of view. What about the epistemological idea, then? Could, could God give us advice? Well, if God is good, and it's part of God's nature to be good, then, of course, God only performs good and right actions. Perhaps God can perform evil actions. Perhaps there is a possible world where God performs evil actions as well, but, but well, let's not bother with that possibility here right now, because in, in the actual world, God only uh, performs morally unobjectionable actions. I concede that. And he gives only good advice. So could we not then just not turn to God for advice? Well, the problem, of course, is that how should we know that, that the advice we receive really is coming from God and not from Satan himself. Uh, even if a man with a white beard is speaking to us from the skies, he may be a fake. And how should, should we ascertain that the, the message is genuine? I mean, the only way to do that is to compare it, I think, with our own moral intuitions. If it's a, morally sound, basically sound message, then it's genuine. If not, it must be from Satan. There is no other way to tell. So this means that even if God can give us, give us moral advice, when the advice is received by us, it's really too late. We already know the message. So that's too a non-starter, the second idea. The third, of course, I mean, it would be foolhardy to deny that that it has worked. I mean, if you read the, the, the sermon on the mountain, is that it's 
coordinating this Sermon on the Mountain. You, you, 